the hope is that if we could end with about 10 minutes early, we have a chance to at least ask a few questions. It's about finishing at 1220. <coughs> Because, yeah. yeah. uh, or I could change this. So I could see. Yeah, this, right. yeah. this. this will be better. This will. Yeah, I don't need to see that. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have done this before for this class, and it's one of my favorite things. That I do, uh, and it paid off. It's paid off uh, in that recently I was invited um, on short notice to submit a chapter for a book that's coming out in November, uh, and they wanted me to write something about a traditional city in Asia somewhere, and so that's what produced the reading that you had for today, and the only reason I felt comfortable. Uh, doing this very quickly is because this class and this presentation has kept me up on the topic. Uh, it's actually the first time I wrote it, it was a term paper for my, uh, my professor at MIT, uh, Professor Hassan Rudin Khan. And um, so it's kind of um, fitting that uh, I return the favor and present this paper or the continuing evolution of this paper uh, on a regular basis over the years. Um, and so uh, the, the, the focus of the book, the uh, version that you read, was more about how the city operates as a cultural artifact. And that was very much the focus of that. But it also, in the context of uh, historic preservation, uh, offers an overview and assuming that you all read and studied it very closely, or will soon, uh, I'm going to dip, uh, take liberty to not go over a lot of the details uh, that are covered in the, um, the reading, and dip uh, more specifically into the implications for historic preservation practice of the situation presented by this specific city and its uh, historic core, the palace in central Java. Um, the interesting thing uh, that ties both versions together is that when you look at a photograph like this, you say, oh, how interesting. This must have been in an archive from the 19th century, back when there was still a connection to the historic way of life. Um, uh, but actually, this was taken uh, in the 1990s, I think 1994 is when I took this photograph. And uh, it was a very strange thing um, that I experienced. And I'm gonna go a little bit autobiographical and this will serve to introduce myself as well. Um, I was a student at the Cooper Union uh, in New York City, a school not well known for its uh, veneration of tradition. Um, it was very much an art school Art, art school version of architecture school, still is. Um, and I was in my third year of a five-year program, and I was doing a, an analysis project on Louis Kahn's Salk Institute, and I started by looking very much at the structure and how the building was built, and was very, found it very interesting. Very quickly, I realized that the moment of truth of this building is not the building itself, but the space that is created uh, in the center of the complex. And so I started thinking a lot about the space and less about the, the solid uh, form of the building itself. And so that took me into uh, an independent study of cities. And I learned Italian, was all set to go to Rome. But something happened. My girlfriend sent me this photo from her trip to J central Java. Uh, and she said, um, if you're interested in space, the space between buildings, you should take a look at this. And there was this mysterious gateway that gave on to this uh, in different world beyond the gate. And um, uh, even though we broke up soon after that, uh, I was still hooked on the whole Java thing. 
And so I skipped the trip to Italy uh, and learned Indonesian, got a three-month grant, and arrived um, at this gate um, not long after uh, to look at how the Javanese city and Javanese architecture dealt with the formation of space, especially how spaces get charged with cultural meaning. And that was what I was really looking at. Um, for context, I had never been here before, and so I was just learning myself. Um, the interesting thing, it turns out, is that Java down here is one of the most densely populated islands, uh, most densely populated places on Earth, and have been for a very long time. Uh, only other places that are comparable are Japan, parts of China, and parts of India. And so because it has such a high population density, and here's um, the island of Java is part of modern day Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world, the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, and basically it stretches from this red line here, all, the, all of these islands, uh, this part of Borneo, all the way up through the tip of Sumatra, all of this is Indonesia. It's about the same breadth as the United States, but much smaller in land area. And of all those places, Java is the most densely populated and the dominant culture. Uh, and it's formed by a string of volcanoes that erupt just often enough to create very fertile soils, uh, which supplied a, a very rich agricultural production and thus the source of great wealth and progress. Uh, in modern day Indonesia, the capital is Jakarta established by the Dutch. Uh, it's got skyscrapers and traffic jams and all the things you would want in a developing world city. Um, the, uh, the kings of Java ruled until World War II, ostensibly uh, because the real rulers were Dutch colonial powers. Then the Japanese invaded. And then after World War II, Indonesia fought a war for independence from the Dutch, won, and General uh, Suharto became the uh, benevolent dictator uh, for 32 years uh, until he was deposed, basically, uh, in 1998 uh, during uh, revolts. But he was able to turn his brutal military iron fist into a velvet glove by inventing this thing called the Indonesian culture. Indonesia is kind of just uh, this bizarre collection of 400 distinct cultures, uh, and of which the Javanese is the dominant, has always been the dominant culture. Uh, but he put together this mythical cultural formation called Indonesian culture, and promised uh, economic development. And so he's the father of development for Indonesia, and delivered very uh, remarkably on his promise of development. Uh, and when it all came falling apart in 98, that was time for him to leave. But Indonesia is, and Java specifically, is filled with uh, extreme um, wealth in terms of cultural, uh, cultural and material uh, wealth. It's, um, this is the largest Buddhist temple in the world, Borobudur. Uh, of central Java. And uh, there are Hindu temples as well, Prambanan of the stone culture. And these, these monuments fit what we think of in the West as suitable objects of preservation. They were built at a, at a flourish, uh, at a moment of high cultural achievement and wealth by rulers who felt comfortable investing in such things. And, um, but then fell into disuse and disrepair and, and kind of the forest took over. And so this is the kind of thing that, that fits our model of historic preservation because uh, the people who built it, uh, the connections to those people who were part of the living culture are all severed. Uh, there is no longer a Buddhist, a strong Buddhist. Uh, there is a Buddhist community and they're centered here. But it's not uh, strongly connected to the original Buddhist community. It's a more recent arrival. 
And so it's familiar to us in the West where we think the reason we need historic preservation in the West is because we have this uh, artifact from this former culture. I'm, I'm, I'm caricaturing, please forgive me. Um, but um, the interesting thing uh, that this study um, that you've read about is what do you do when the culture has not uh, left the stage, has not left the scene? What do you do when the people who built it, the, or at least the great-grandchildren of the people who built the original uh, fabric that is worthy of preservation, what if they're still around? And what if they're still continuing the practices that produced that original uh, artifact or set of artifacts worth preserving? Um, what does that mean for how you approach the practice of preservation? Um, and so that's what we're going to look at. This is um, a diagram of the Hindu cosmological model of the universe. At the center is the great island, uh, and with the mountain Meru, where the gods uh, of Hinduism live. And they're surrounded by a series of concentric oceans and ringed continents until reaching the vast nothingness on either side. And so this is the Hindu structure of the universe. Um, in the early centuries, of the common era, uh, the trade winds blowing between China and India brought Chinese and Indian merchants to the island of Java and left a very deep cultural imprint on the island. Uh, both cultures did, but the predilection for uh, anything Hindu uh, made the Javanese grasp at everything coming from India and deny any connection to anything coming from China. It's their cultural uh, prejudice against the Chinese and for and an admiration for anything from India. And so the Javanese kings, and that doesn't come out, it's this. Basically, this pattern of the universe, uh, in India, the practice was to take this pattern and create a, a microcosm of it on Earth. And so that would be a temple palace complex. And so there are still traditional Indian cities that have that form still intact and preserved uh, in India. Uh, but the best model I've ever seen is here in Java, which is the city that I arrived at. It's called Solo, or the traditional name is Surakarta. And so this is the, the palace of Surakarta. And the thing that's not really showing up, well, we'll keep going. Oh, yeah. That might be. So this, this model of the universe in Hindu and then Hindu-Javanese. So, so the Javanese embraced the Hindu religion and um, folded it into the traditional Javanese religious practices and beliefs before it that were already uh, prevalent in the island of Java. And in the process, they created a, a palace complex that, that replicated the Hindu practice of serving as a model of the universe. So the palace complex itself is, follows this pattern. And when I arrived in uh, Solo, Surakarta, uh, I found that there was already, um, there wasn't what I expected at all. Uh, it turns out that this gate that I had come to was part of something um, much bigger. I, uh, it turns out there was a palace at the center of the city. And this palace, uh, maybe this is the right way to look at it. Um, the gate that I was attracted to is over in this neighborhood, uh, which was peripheral just outside the outer palace wall. And it turned out that there was this much larger thing going on that all had to do with these interlocking nested courtyard spaces that formed a cosmological model of the universe. And so um, the vast ocean beyond 
the ringed oceans, uh, the ringed continents and ocean pattern are out here in a vast town square at the north and the south of the palace. And then each gateway is a continent and each courtyard is an ocean. And so the rings of continent, you know, the gate, each gate is continent, ocean, continent, ocean, continent, ocean, until you get to the mountain at the center of the complex. And uh, this wasn't just uh, a reflection of the uh, cosmological order. It was also considered to be an instrument for creating and re uh, sustaining the balance between heaven and earth. Because all good fortune flows from heaven to the earth through an umbilical cord, imagine connecting heaven and earth, and the belly button of the world is right here. And so from the mother, all the nutrients come into the baby um, and spreads out in concentric circles of sacredness uh, out to fill the rest of the world. And so this palace complex, and I've turned them all on their side to maintain the orientation. North is to the right, um, south is to the left. And this is the sacred ceremonial axis running north-south. And so we have the, the vast ocean at the north and the south. And then each gateway and courtyard um, leads to the sacred center. And it turns out this is not just a simple reflection of uh, the cosmos in the Hindu Javanese belief system. It's actually an instrument for creating balance. So in order to ensure that the good fortune continues to flow into the world, uh, different ceremonies would be held at different locations in the palace in order to ensure that flow or to restore the balance. So if there is a famine somewhere in the palace, uh, or if there's a famine somewhere on the island of Java, uh, let's say an outer province off to the uh, west, well then the appropriate location that is associated with that location on the island of Java would be the location where a ceremony, a sacrifice, some ritual would be enacted. And that would actually, uh, it was believed that that would resolve the problem and restore fertility or to calm an erupting volcano. Uh, or to uh, increase the wealth of the people in that area of the, of the, the island. And so uh, this wasn't just a dead monument that I expected when I arrived. It turns out there, uh, one of the first people I met, I thought he was the man who just managed the tours at this crumbling, broken down palace. Uh, but it turns out he was a prince. And it turns out that there were 36 princes and princesses. And it turns out there were six queens and one king. And it turns out that there was still a very strong religious practice uh, and a lot of followers who still believed in this uh, system. And it was still growing, going strong. Uh, even as the palace itself physically was crumbling, uh, there was this bizarre, to me, juxtaposition of cars and bicycle taxis and polo shirts and these strange outfits that are more traditional, but hybrids of all kinds of cultural influences coming into this place. Um, and so this was, um, this is Prince Dipo Kusumo, who became a very close friend of mine. And when my three-month grant ran out, I decided to stay a little bit longer. And before I knew it, I was there for four years um, and doing work on the restoration of the palace. Um, I'm going to do a quick sampling of some of the things that uh, shocked me into realizing that this was not a dead monument, but very much uh, a living piece of cultural, uh, living culture. And the architecture and the buildings play a central role. Um, this is one of the oldest pavilions of the palace, a wood structure, so very vulnerable to rot and very important one to uh, maintain on a regular basis. At the center, there was a glass pavilion with a curtain in 
And the story was that inside there, there's a cannon, but no one's allowed to look at the cannon. No one's allowed to see it. But three times a year, it needs to be cleaned by priests. And so uh, this is one of those cleanings. They pour buckets of water on the pavilion. Uh, one of the priests um, cleans the cannon. This is one of the uh, servants of the palace. You can tell because he's wearing the red and gold uh, Samir, which is an indication to the Queen of the South Seas that he is a friend of the king's. Um, and so it's dangerous to enter the palace without wearing one of these things because the Queen of the South Seas, uh, who's not has nothing to do with Hinduism, but she's one of the uh, elements of the belief system that existed even after the advent of Hinduism and the subsequent advent of Islam. And so the pavilion gets cleaned, the priest cleans the cannon, and as the water is squeegeed off of the pavilion, uh, these women scramble uh, to try to get the water into their, their bottles. And so they have funnels and jugs and plastic bottles and they're, they get as much of the water as they can get, even squeezing out the rags uh, to get the last drop of water that came off of this building. And this water is not very appealing, but they take it home and they, they mix it into soup or they drink it whenever they're sick or they put it on their crops to ensure a harvest. Um, you've seen these things before. This is part of the another ceremony that occurs several times a year. Um, this is actually incorporated. These are symbols of the linga and the yoni, the male and female genitalia of Hinduism. But they are used in the Islamic uh, celebration of the uh, prophet's uh, birthday and on the anniversary of his ascension to heaven. Um, it's paraded through the palace and taken to the Grand Mosque at the north uh, square at, uh, of the palace. And then <coughs> young men scramble again to <coughs> tear these things apart, grab whatever they can from it because of the power that it holds for healing or for crops. <coughs> and I think I have one more. Um, so the first of these ceremonies, it seemed like, OK, there's a bunch of old ladies who are still hanging on to these traditions. I understand that. Um, but then it turns out that these young guys are into this too. So, okay, it's kind of a cult following, but still, you know, it's not very widespread. Uh, but then came uh, the Javanese New Year. Uh, and it starts in the afternoon where the, the uh, servants of the palace, of which there turn out to be thousands, turns out they're not paid because the palace has no money. If they had money, they would not let their buildings crumble into pieces. Um, so they're basically volunteers. They're given a little bit of money uh, just to be present for these rituals. And uh, they sit in silent vigil uh, for several hours waiting for darkness uh, to come. And this is them filing in through the gates of the palace. I'm not sure why it's so dark. but. Um, but they're not the only ones. It turns out that tens of thousands of people from the surrounding villages walk into the city of Solo and line the streets in order to be present for the, uh, the Javanese New Year uh, celebration slash ceremony slash religious ritual. And so they're waiting at the gates of the palace until uh, the big event. and. Um, so the big event starts when the king emerges from the center of the palace, the sacred center of the palace where all the holy uh, heirlooms, the, um, the crown jewels, the sacred objects that are not just valuable materially because they're made out of gold. Some of them are made out of gold, but some of them are simple wood and, and metal. And, uh, but they are imbued with uh, strong spiritual power. And so uh, the king, with his religious advisors, choose certain objects based on what went wrong last year and what they anticipate, what the priests predict will go wrong in the coming year. 
they choose specific objects. And uh, the objects are cloaked in shrouds to make sure that they're kept a secret because they don't want people to know. Uh, some objects are associated with earthquakes and, and natural disasters, some with, other, with uprisings. And so it's important to keep the identity of these objects a secret. And so they choose the objects, they cloak them, they parade them out of the palace and around the palace in uh, the appropriate direction. Um, and the, the parade, and I don't have good pictures of this, um, but the parade is led by uh, a herd of sacred white buffalo that supposedly know when it's time for this event, and they come down from the hills. They come to the palace, and they await at the front of the palace for this to occur. The servants of the king, the priests, carry the sacred objects shrouded in cloaks, and they line up behind the sacred white buffalo. When the sacred white buffalo are ready to go, they go. When they're not ready to go, they don't go. And so uh, everyone lines up behind them until there's a parade of several thousand people uh, from the palace. And the streets are lined with the villagers six or seven deep for the entire route of the parade. And when the buffalo stop, everybody stops. And when the buffalo rush forward, everyone uh, trots after them as best they can, wearing these tight skirts, the men and the women. And so, uh, and when the buffalo do what they need to do every once in a while, which is defecate on the street, the young men, again, mostly, uh, charge into the street and push and shove each other to try to get some of that holy excrement. Uh, and they soak up the urine from the buffaloes in, in their sarongs. And they try to take it as much of it as home as they can because it's considered to be sacred. So it's one thing to see a couple dozen old women uh, collecting the water. It's another thing to see a, you know, 100 or 200 young men tearing apart this, uh, this offering in front of the mosque. But then when you see tens of thousands of people engaging in such silly behaviors, uh, you start to realize that um, there's something big going on here, that this is not just uh, a vestigial cultural artifact like a, a Labor Day parade. Uh, this is, has religious importance to a lot of people. Another interesting thing that happened was uh, some of the sacred artifacts of the palace were clearly not Javanese. This was a, a carriage given, from, uh, given by the Queen of the Netherlands to the King of Java as a gift. And it has since become increasingly sacred by sitting in the palace. And so every Thursday night, there is an offering given to this carriage, and it has uh, it's been given a name in Javanese, Kyai Garuda Kenchono, which means the sacred conveyance of the gods. And so it's not just a Baroque Dutch carriage that's interesting stop on the tour uh, of the palace. It is a sacred object that has spiritual power for impacting uh, the balance between heaven and earth within the context of the Javanese religious system. Similarly, uh, the architecture itself underwent uh, a bizarre Baroque turn uh, in the 18th and 19th century when one of the kings uh, became very, a very big fan of Dutch style architecture. And uh, so this is very much considered a Javanese, uh, appropriate Javanese architectural style. Uh, the brass band similarly uh, has become something that is inherently Javanese. The Javanese have a word uh, that basically translates as, it's a verb, to Javanize something is to incorporate it into the culture and make it Javanese. So over the centuries they have Javanized all kinds of things, including, you can't really see it, um, the lefebs from the Middle East. Uh, this is a, a, a tux tails coat uh, from Europe that 
one day a prince from this palace was uh, attending uh, an event where the king was going to be there, and so he had to wear the traditional Javanese sarong. Uh, and, but also the Dutch regent was going to be there, so he had to wear the, the European tux, uh, tails coat. And when you wear the Javanese sarong, uh, you have to wear a short dagger like a short sword, a long dagger short sword, tucked into your waist in the back. Uh, and this was just a requirement. And so in a brilliant fashion statement in the 19th century, he had his tailor snip the tails off of the European tux jacket so that it wouldn't interfere with the short sword tucked into his waist. And that was the birth of what is now the traditional uh, costume of, um, of the palace. Okay. Now, this is what I found when I arrived. And, uh, and I was told that there was a group uh, from the local university that was also quite interested in the palace and its architecture. The architecture department uh, at the university, very sophisticated, Lots of people who studied architecture in the West, including several who studied historic preservation in the United States uh, and Japan and in Europe. And so uh, I was told that they uh, were producing a, a plan for the preservation of this palace. Uh, and so I went to see them, and they indeed did have this very clear, they were putting the final touches on this massive document uh, funded by the United Nations and uh, by the Ministry of Tourism uh, that had you know, a very logical, rational, scientifically uh, reinforced uh, plan for the palace. And uh, it was based on uh, the model of colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, <coughs> which you've heard of. Uh, I imagine you've studied it. And so they were quite excited to meet an actual American architect. And so they, they, they welcomed me with open arms and uh, showed me with great excitement everything they were, they were planning on. And uh, this was part of it. This was, um, these are photographs. These are the only photographs I've ever seen of what is essentially the harem. This is where all the, the wives and the concubines and the small children of the king uh, live in the palace, and it's forbidden zone. I've seen, I've documented and drawn and photographed and seen every part of the palace, but I've never even seen photographs other than these two of this part of the palace because it is so off limits. So the plan, uh, and even the, the princes, when they reach puberty, they got to get out. So they never see it again. The princes never go back home to where they grew up because it's the harem. They can't go in there. So that's how forbidden this zone is. Um, but here it describes um, the plan to uh, take this and um, move, move the, the women and the children out of the palace, fix it up, and convert it into a five-star hotel. Uh, and so this is just one of uh, dozens of examples of what the plan was for the palace. Basically, um, the royal family was to be moved out of the palace, given you know, compensation, and the palace would be completely fixed up because you can't have uh, decaying buildings uh, as your tourist attraction. And you also convert all of the buildings into... Attract, tourist attraction functions, bookstore, museum, cinema, um, you know, all kinds of anything you can imagine in an entertainment uh, venue uh, would become part of the palace. And then in order to give it an authenticity, you hire actors to play the role of royal family uh, and bring them in and they would, sh they would drive and park and come in and then pretend like they do in Colonial Williamsburg, to not know what cameras are, 
to not know what cars are, to not know what the internet is, and to pretend that it was some appropriate date, you know, 1873, when um, the last, the, the height of the culture of the, the tenth king. And this is uh, a model imagining the Dutch fortress being reconfigured as a shopping mall complex and a uh, five-star hotel. Um, and so the whole, in this crude map, the palace was part of a larger tourism complex. There's actually two palaces, the lesser palace and the, the greater palace. Um, the ceremonial axis continues here. There's the Dutch fortress. And so it turned into this urban vision of the reconstruction uh, of the entire town. And indeed, some of it was executed by the Minister of Tourism. He came in, uh, got a lot of money, and the palace doesn't have a lot of money itself, and it doesn't have a lot of power. So they really couldn't say no to the Minister of Tourism. And so they rebuilt one of the sections that had burned down in a fire. They hired a lot of uh, wood carvers from tourist villages in, around Jakarta. They came in. There was lots of corporate sponsorship to make sure it happened. So they got their name on the door. Um, they did air conditioning and made it all nice. And you know, they went down to the light fixture store and got something nice and old towny. And they rebuilt this pavilion, this royal dining hall that had burned down in the fire. But they did it in a way that was dictated by the current best practices of faux, uh, you know, old style. There are hotels uh, that have a similar uh, level of authenticity or lack thereof. Um, and so there's the finished hall, quite nice, but um, these are not uh, authentically, uh, they're not accurate. Um, and so the response of, uh, to all these plans by the students at the local university was to stage a series of protests. There were several princesses who went on a hunger strike saying, you can't turn our palace into uh, this cheap tourist attraction. We live here. The religious practices are still important. You can't just stop this uh, whole thing. You wouldn't do this to the Vatican. And so uh, they, the royal family, some members of the royal family asked me for help in uh, navigating um, this, these troubled waters. And so the president of the Issei Shrine, which I believe you've also studied. You did? Okay. It's mentioned. So the trouble with wooden architecture is that it decays and doesn't last long. So we tend to uh, inherit stone structures or grandiose structures made of durable materials like Borobudur and Prambanan, the stone monuments of Java. But in Japan, they have a long tradition of uh, maintaining forests and maintaining craftsmen and every 20 years rebuilding uh, temples like the Issei Shrine, so that each generation uh, gets a chance to take on the responsibility for preserving the knowledge of how to build these sacred temples. And so the wood is harvested from uh, the sacred forest. Uh, it's prepared and dressed. And the entire process of construction and reconstruction is a religious undertaking. The woodworkers are not just trained builders, they are priests. They are spiritual authorities, uh, prepared uh, not just technically to build, but spiritually to engage in the appropriate rituals. Um, the king uh, of Java is the man in charge. He's at the center of the maintaining of the rituals. Uh, and when we uh, successfully got permission to do our work in a different way. Before we started anything, we had to perform the sacred offerings. Uh, we engaged in a set of document, you know, documenting the palace, doing measured drawings. Uh, we carefully uh, took castings of some of the pieces to make sure that uh, we understood uh, what the tradition of ornamentation would be. And prior to even entering the buildings, 
um, the chief carpenter, the head builder, who is also a priest, uh, would engage in a series of prayers to make sure that everything was being followed, all the rules were being followed. Uh, so here he is, the chief carpenter, who is also a priest and a very important figure in the hierarchy of the palace. Um, and when we said to the, the king, uh, well, we were fortunate to attract the attention of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which wanted to hold the 1995 uh, Aga Khan Award for Architecture awards ceremony in the palace in Java. Uh, and so we approached the king and proposed that we do this and um, suggested that there might be money available to do to perform some much needed uh, restoration work on the palace. Uh, he said, well, I know this isn't central to the ceremony itself, but it is central to, it's the, the greatest risk to the per ongoing performance of religious ceremonies at the palace is that the tower dedicated to the Queen of the South Seas, which is off limits to everyone but the king and one priest, um, <coughs> but it was to be converted into an observation deck uh, in the conservation plan by the local university. He said, this tower has several columns that are crumbling. This is the most, in, most at risk piece of the palace. Uh, if you do this first, then you can do what will serve more directly the purposes of the award ceremony. And so um, working with the, this is Pak Asmo, the, uh, the head carpenter, um, hand hewing the, the replacement columns. And uh, there it is in place. And once that was done, we could move on to the, the, uh, the restoration of the uh, components of the buildings that, where the award ceremony was to be held. And so here you see the offerings in the background um, that preceded any work by these young men. Of course, now, this time, they're wearing the required uh, Samir to indicate the queen of, to the Queen of the South Seas that um, they are OK to be here. Um, there are many things that would have been done differently if it had been guided purely by the technical uh, expertise of conservation. For example, uh, you see these cracks in the wooden planks of the ceiling are being filled by a very rigid auto body putty, which, by the way, you should never do. You should never, ever put a rigid material in a wooden uh, assembly like this because wood breathes, wood changes, wood uh, expands and contracts. Uh, wood is still alive somewhat. And so you never, this was a very difficult moment for us because we knew that you should never ever do this. But uh, we were not the ones in charge. We were very careful to make sure that we weren't just coming in from the outside, restoring the palace, and then leaving. We needed to, given our understanding of the situation, it was primary, of primary importance, that we, that this process do the opposite of what prior processes had done. Previously, uh, people had come in from the outside, well-funded, well-educated, do their project and leave without involving the local community. So this was an extremely disempowering thing to do, and the ability for the local community in the palace for the royal family itself to, uh, to manage its obligations to the religion and to the fabric of the, of the palace, it actually undermined in the long term. It actually possibly did more harm than good. And so we were committed to not repeating that error. And so at every stage, we consulted with the king himself and the people that the king uh, designated as being the ones in charge of such matters. And they're the ones who said, this is what we do. We use a rigid auto body filler, Bondo. Uh, and so we, we cringed and watched it happen. It turns out, going back years later, that the humidity is so stable that it works just fine. 
the wood is not expanding and contracting, even through the rainy season and the dry season. The dry season is, has a humidity of like 80%. The rainy season has a humidity of 100% or something. Uh, but it's such a narrow fluctuation that it really didn't turn out to be an issue. Uh, and so the finished product um, from this to this to this, uh, restoring the actual original chandeliers that were a gift from uh, France, um, the doors similarly um, restoring everything. And just to finish up, uh, when the king died in 2002, there was a struggle for succession amongst my friends uh, at the palace. And one, fam one segment of the family uh, emerged, and the others were evicted from the palace, uh, which was a very medieval, uh, traumatic thing to have happened. But um, now there, uh, there are two factions. One occupies the palace and does its best to maintain the ceremonies. Another one has set up an alternative palace in a suburban house outside of the city. And so it will be very interesting to see how this plays out over the years. I'm going back for a visit in a few weeks, um, and I'll try to check in and see um, how this is playing out. This is the exiled king um, in his suburban house uh, trying to maintain all of the rituals that he would be in charge of if he were back in the palace. Um, if I play my cards right, maybe I can land a consulting job uh, in the design of a new palace, which is what would have happened prior to the Dutch colonial period. Well, prior to the Dutch colonial period, there would have been a war um, between the factions for control of the palace. But uh, uh, in more recent times, the right thing to do is to establish a new palace. And um, so I don't know if that's what they're doing, but that's kind of where we're at. And um, so it's uh, like, a, yeah, we'll stop there and open it up for discussion. I hope I didn't stop too soon. OK, thank you. Thank you.